Welcome to the Wickedly Smart Women podcast, featuring stellar conversations with emerging and established Wickedly Smart Women. Thanks for joining us today as we celebrate women who are committed, care deeply, and have the courage to take action and create conscious change all around the world. Now here's your Wickedly Smart host, Angel B. Hartwell. Welcome to another episode of the Wickedly Smart Women podcast, where we celebrate Wickedly Smart Women and provide our listeners with a wealth of wisdom, along with immediately actionable steps to be smarter, spunkier, and more successful in their impact and their leadership. This is your host, Angel B. Hartwell, and today we welcome our special guest, Rebecca Eggers. Rebecca is the creator of The Passion Path, the Flair Brand Storytelling Method, and The Ruby Mirror. She is also the author of Coming Alive, Spirituality, Activism, and Living Passionately in the Age of Global Domination. Rebecca lives in the mountainous highlands of Chiapas, Mexico. She makes all kinds of trouble for every last stagnant, soul-killing enemy of your potential. Rebecca challenges you to make your mark and bring your dreams to life. She is trained as a metaphysical minister, a co-active life coach, a Reiki master, and a tax lawyer. Probably weren't expecting that last part, eh? Welcome to the show, Rebecca. I'm so delighted to have you here today. Delighted to be here. Well, when we were in the green room before we got started today, we were talking a little bit about uh, global domination. And I'm curious, Rebecca, about like, where did your spirituality and activism emanate from? As a child, were you in a spiritual family? Were you in an activist family? Or is it something that came as a result of some kind of spiritual awakening or cosmic two by four that sometimes we get (laughs) cosmic two by four. Um, Ooh, well, there's a couple, there's a confluence of things that came together. I grew up, um, in an evangelical, uh, family. Um, my mother was involved in evangelical ministry in a prison. And in 1997, uh, I'm going to try not to cry. In 1997, she was murdered. Um, so like the way you asked that question, it just sort of like made me kind of like condense this whole story into like a single narrative in a way that it just feels like a seed almost. Um, so in 2009, uh, we were supposed to go to trial in that case and they dropped all the charges the week before we went, we were supposed to go to trial. And in retrospect, I'm glad they did because I don't think they had the case to win. Um, so that that kind of started a period for me of like really deep spiritual exploration of my own. Um, you know, I had gone back to the evangelical church to kind of try to understand my mother's path. And then I also then I went off in a different direction to kind of find my own path after that happened. And I ended up in Maine um, with a high priestess who uh, serves in the temple of Mahat, who is the Egyptian goddess of, co- you know, justice, cosmic consciousness, and balance. Really, mm-hmm. so I sought her out for healing because I was just devastated by that whole experience. It had been like a couple of years of like build up to that, and it it was just devastating. Like. Not just that we didn't go to trial, but um, because I think I couldn't have withstood if we had lost at trial, Um, but that I, you know, I relive every time this comes up, I relive it again. Mm -hmm. Um, And as it happens last year, they arrested the same man and we're on the same track right now. (laughs) Um, So I'm reliving that again. So anyway. And I I feel like this time there's going to be closure and there's going to be justice. And I'm really holding that inside myself. Um, But how that kind of influenced where I went is that after I started to work with Mahat, I ended up in Tulum, Mexico, New Year's Eve, 2009, after this, you know, whack in the head 
experience for the second time. Um, and I met a man there who was connected to the Zapatista rebels in Chiapas. And I just knew like my, my Spanish was terrible. I, you know, um, I, like I could ask the most basic questions, like you're not going to kill me was one of them. <laughs> was so ignorant of what he was even talking about. Um, but I knew I had to come to Chiapas. Mm -hmm. So the next time we had spring break and my daughter went to her father's house, I got on a plane and I landed in Villa Hermosa because I didn't even know there was an airport in Tuxla Gutierrez, which was like an hour from here. So I took this epic bus ride from Villa Hermosa down to, you know, San Cristobal de las Casas, where I live now, um, in search of this person and in search of these answers that I didn't really even know why I needed them. Um, I knew at the time that I was of native descent. I didn't really understand what that meant because my mother raised us, you know, in white society, which is what my ancestors chose. And they, when they left the nation, we would otherwise be affiliated with. So I have this thing in me where I'm, I have all the blood <laughs> of all the mm. things. And I didn't really know what that was about. Mm. So I wound up in Chiapas kind of on this search for understanding of questions I didn't know to ask at all. Mm. And it was very much wrapped up in Mahat. And, you know, I was definitely being led on an, on a journey of understanding that ultimately led to me writing the book. I moved here at the end of 2011 um, for good um, and wrote the book in 2012 and 2013. And like people say a book, you know, is super difficult to write. And for me, I sat down and six weeks later, I got up with a book. Like I just, it just poured out of me. Like I'd been preparing my whole life to write it. Mm, beautiful. Well, thank you for sharing that. And, you know, what I want our listeners to hear here, because we have a lot of different women who are on the show and, you know, I have my own journey and my own story as, as all women do. Uh, what I want our listeners to hear is the knowing that you, you knew, you knew what you knew and you took action on what you knew to get you to where you are today. Um, and to really, you affirmed yourself and you validated yourself in this whole process of bringing the book to life and relocating and becoming who you've become. And so for anybody who's listening, I really want you to hear that it's possible to transit seemingly horrific experiences and to, from those experiences, find the way to self-trust and honoring your knowing. So um, I want to talk now about Rebecca, about this idea of living passionately in the age of global domination, because, you know, you mentioned the rebels, they're rebelling against something. So mm -hmm. let's talk a little bit about that, about that subject and about how we can create change in, in this kind of a culture at this point. Okay. So in the microcosm of where I live, you know, the rebellion was, as they would put it, against 500 years of oppression of indigenous people in this region. Um, in the macrocosm of the world, um, you know, I, I think I would, if I were writing the book today, I would talk about living passionately in the age of global domination breaking down into <laughs> chaos. Um, when I was writing before, I was looking at it as a system and again, I didn't fully understand what I was writing about. I relied on other sources. I do understand now much better of what I was writing about. But the, the way that domination had been established on kind of a global basis as, you know, the values that were really, I mean, it's hard to say where they were born, but, you know, there's a lot of ways you could look at how historically, you know, we got to this place where domination became the means of, of managing uh, the world, but the Roman empire is probably a good place to start. And the Roman empire, you know, relied on domination and in order to control its imperial borders and expand its imperial borders. And at times it was 
a peaceful, it provided peace. And at other times it, you know, it was uh, in other ways, we should say <laughs> it was also quite brutal. Um, and of course that's a long history, but that then influenced Europe and then Europe became the colonial powers that like moved out and became kind of the world. And after World War II, the United States was really like the unipolar or, well, it was a bipolar, you know, it was a bipolar system that existed between the U.S. and the Soviet Union. But the U.S. from World War II until recently was really controlling who was in the commerce, who was part of the world, right? And the Soviet Union wasn't really considered part of the world and lots of other people, you know, countries weren't considered part of the world, but that was pretty established control of, and, and protection of waterways and things like that and an established order um, that grew out of the colonial roots. So that now, so we went through a period when then it was just the United States and it was a unipolar period. And now we're seeing that that's breaking down, that order is breaking down because the things that created that order are gone. The demographics are gone. But, you know, the kind of once in a, I don't know how long, once in a, a millennia of factors that that gave rise to what we're living now is gone. Mm. Yeah. So. All right. Well, let's um, let's talk a little bit before we get to the break. We're close to the break, but I'd really like to talk a little bit about how money play, you know, the role that money plays in all of this when you talk about. Um, you know, global domination at this point, it's, it's become very polarized in terms of the haves and the have nots, even here in the U S which, you know, had for decades had this maybe fantasy, but maybe reality burgeoning middle-class that now no longer even exists here. Yeah. So I would say that the whole entire system was set up to sweep money into the United States. Um, so if you if you consider how money is made and you know if you look at monetary policy the united states has enjoyed the position of being the global reserve currency and the oil reserve currency so it's been a very prominent position that it's just like a faucet that just poured money because of the demand for dollars and we've had massive shifts around money in the last you know really in, since 2008 um, there've been a lot of pivotal shifts around money. So it's like borders have implications for where money naturally goes and doesn't go. And then the monetary policy of the United States and the structural issues within the United States has implications for where money goes and where it doesn't go. And that's central to what is both under attack right now. And as we are in a multipolar world and other powers are making a play, um, and it's also still quite powerfully present. Mm, yeah. All right. We are going to take a short break. When we come back, we're going to let people know where they can find out more about you. And we're going to talk a little bit more about your direct work. Um, but right now we are taking a quick few minute break and Wickedly Smart Women, we could use your help. If you're enjoying this show, please consider joining our community, making a donation at wickedlysmartwomen.com and sharing with your lovely lady friends that might benefit from our content. Help a gal out and let your sisters, mothers, daughters, friends, and colleagues know about the show so that we can serve them too. I want to say a big thank you to all of our listeners who are downloading, rating, and reviewing. We're welcoming thousands and thousands of downloads from all over the world. I want to shout out this week to our listeners in Mexico, as well as Romania and Cyprus. And we will be right back with Rebecca Eggers. The Wickedly Smart Women podcast is brought to you by the Wealthy Life Mentor. Women, are you on the edge knowing that life is calling you to make a change? Are you ready to be part of the evolution of what it means to be a wickedly smart woman creating your wealthy life by design, a life that is an extraordinary work of art? Angel B. Hartwell, the Wealthy Life Mentor, is hired by women in transition, women just like you who want to break through to their brilliance, become clear on the value of their wisdom, and embody a beauty-filled, balanced life of shameless self-expression. 
Discover your wealthy life readiness by taking the quiz at quiz.wealthylifementor.com. And we are back with Rebecca Eggers. You can find out more about Rebecca and all she has going on, the Passion Path work, the Flair brand storytelling method, and her Ruby Mirror at thepassionpath.vision. I'm told that you can get access to all of her wonderfulness over at that site, and we will have that for you in the show notes. So before we went to the break, we were talking about global domination, and we were talking about the monetization system the monetary system. What I, And we also talked about your own spiritual journey and what led you to Chappas. What I'd like to do now, Rebecca, is talk a little bit about how you have started and grown your own work, your own body of work, and what inspired you to create the passion path. Tell us a little bit about what that is. Tell us about your Flair brand storytelling method and tell us about the Ruby Mirror. Okay. Uh, you know, I can't even tell you that I know what inspired me before. I think it's Mm. more important that what inspires me now Mm. is that I really want to help the people who want to do big things, do those things. Mm. And what I know about radical change is that it puts you in conflict with yourself as the creator of that work. And it's happening on a global level as we're trying to innovate our way into a new way of being on the planet. So I have spent years and years, 13 years at this point, really developing my skills without much concern for anything else, developing my skills, developing my understanding, and really building to the place where coming into a session with me is a life-changing experience, so much so that I don't have a sales pitch. Mm. I, I hear that. The, I hear the that. First, <laughs> <laughs> the first <laughs> section is this is the experience that determines whether we work together or not. And that's a two-way determination. <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah, beautiful. Well, one of the things that you mentioned when we were in the green room is that you really are in in a space in your own journey right now where you want to help people to see what's happening in the world. And to be able to see more clearly, especially those who are called to be disruptors. So I'd love to have you speak a little bit about what, you know, what exactly does it look like to work with you? What, what kind of person is the right alignment for you to say, you know, you said it's a two-way conversation to say, I'll take, I'll take this person on. Uh, They want to do really big things. They're They are a driving force of change and change is a driving force for them. And so they're willing to work with the chaos that comes between where you are and where you're trying to go. Um, And that takes some fortitude. You know, the most, the most destructive thing in the work that I do in terms of people falling out of the work is something I call perilous nostalgia, because you get to a certain edge of inventing or reinventing or innovating where that innovation is an internal innovation. And if you can't make that internal innovation, then you're not going to cross that threshold. So it's not just like perhaps maybe innovation in widgets. It's like innovation in you know the way that the world moves. It's the innovation in the way that you move. And you sooner or later, you come up against that place where it feels like you know, your inner atoms are being split. Um, And the challenge is that, you know, that that splitting actually doesn't occur, but that it becomes fusion. So my work this year is uh, flourishing fusion, activate the redshift renaissance. So that is multifaceted, but it's about like the way that the light at the edge of the known universe is shifted red. And if you just stretch a little bit further, you're in the unknown, completely in the unknown. And that's the passion path. It's the place between stimulus and response. It's the pause between how you used to do things and how you're going to do them. And then it's also just sometimes instinct just does what it does. And then you're, you know, you are where you are. (laughs) Mm. Once you activate, I guess I would say it like this. 
once you activate with me the thing that you say you want to create, that that is the passion path and it does what it does. Mm. And we do that together. Yeah. Beautiful. So you're, you're a container and a catalyst. Mm -hmm. Right. I would say that's accurate. Okay, great. So I would love to have you talk now a little bit, Rebecca, about as you stepped into owning your own business, because we do have a lot of women who are listening who may be in that place of, you know, being called to another part of the world or being called to another career or being called into, you know, making big change in the world. And the vehicle for that is their entrepreneurial venture, their small business. I'd love to have you speak a little bit about if there were any challenges for you specifically around monetization when you first stepped into saying yes to doing the work that you're doing now? Uh, I think there's always a challenge in the work that I'm doing now in terms of monetization for one really important reason. Um, It takes a special kind of person to commit to the kind of work that I'm doing. And so my work and my monetization look a lot different than someone who's selling, um, you know, like a simple method for doing your lead magnet or something like I'm selling the gut rehab of who you are. And that's, that's a special process for me, for the person I'm working with, it's it's a, a fusion that hopefully becomes a flourishing fusion. Um, but it's always a risky, it's risk. I live on the edge of risk all the time. My entire life is perched on the edge of risk. And it has been from the moment I stepped onto this path until now, because money can never be the driving force of what I do. I have to be willing to let the money go to stand in the integrity of the work at any moment. So those are the challenges that are, that continue to be there for me. And part of, you know, the other thing I think I want to say is there's a lot of genius, a lot of amazing talent that's locked in poverty and locked out of the conversation. So I've begun developing sources of support for myself that are independent of the work so that I can offer what amount to sponsored scholarships uh, to people who really have high economic need, but they also have a project that the world really needs. And that's that's part of, of my heart. And that's been a really fruitful path for me to get on because it allows me to develop the work and the money separately in some sense. Yeah, I hear that. I have a, a client of mine who has her $15 million business that underwrites her passion project, (laughs) which, you know, sometimes we have to, we have to make those choices. Sometimes we choose to make money in a certain way and then utilize that money to serve the bigger picture. So let's talk about the bigger picture. And one of the pieces of work that you, you have is the Ruby mirror, which is your oracular work. So I am curious if you have anything that you'd like the women who are listening to become aware of that is coming from that lens, the lens of your oracular work? Yeah. Um, First of all, my oracular work is developing to be way more than just astrology or tarot. Like I have evolutionary tarot. I have, I work with Egyptian, I have my own system of astrology that I'm developing that uses the current charts, but to create an alchemical perspective. Um, And then I look at global macro trends, kind of reading the markets like tea leaves. What I would say to everyone right now, the number one message that I want to get to people is that we need an inner integration um, that involves uh, integrating the functions of the left and the right brain, integrating the aspects of ourselves that Uh, have maybe been missing in action. I do soul reconciliation because what we're looking at right now uh, is gone, is not real anymore. It was created in something that wasn't real and the change is exponential. And if we don't access fully the right brain creative functions and Ian McGilchrist's work is amazing in this area. So, you know, there's scientific work underway to, to really understand this, but if we don't have access to the right brain, we're looking at an illusion and we think it's real. So, um, you know, my oracular work is is uh, very mm, disruptive. Don't go look at it unless you want to go where it's taking you. There are two journeys up now on the Ruby Mirror 
from the eclipses. Um, and I'm about to do one for the, you know, the Jupiter Uranus conjunction that's taking place in Taurus. And they're very much journeys and they're very much meant to have an alchemical impact. So uh, that's, that's a very personal decision about getting, getting into those readings. Well, you know, I think that I would totally agree with you, this idea of the inner integration. And I feel like we're at what I like to call the dawning of the creative age. We're at the beginning of the creative age and, and we came to be disruptive. We came on planet to be the witnesses to the, the, dismantling of a lot of the systems that, you know, were here when we, we first got here. So my last question for you is as an activist, what guidance do you have for anybody who's listening, who really is a disruptor out there um, for them to be able to maintain their clarity, their sanity, their well-being? I address some of this in my book, which is that we tend to silo into spiritual spaces versus activism spaces, and neither of them is complete without the other. And spiritual can mean a lot of things. But at the core of it, I think my advice is actually the same, that you really need the inner integration of darkness and light and left and right. And, you know, all of these things that have, are so polarized in our world, or else your activism is aimed at a a false, a false story about what was instead of what can be. And that doesn't mean we dismiss history. We need to understand history so that we don't make it rhyme again, but we can't, you know, we can't, we can't stay in the historical perspective. We need a revolutionary perspective that's from outside of what we're living now. And that's where the spiritual perspective comes in from a, a variety of different spiritual paths. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The vision, we need the visionaries. We are at that time where it's important to um, both honor your vision, express your vision and actualize your vision. Would you agree? Absolutely. Beautiful. Well, we are at the end. I am so grateful that you came today, Rebecca. And I hope that our listeners have taken away something very powerful just from hearing the sound of your voice. Listeners, we love feedback. Please let us know what you think of today's episode. Go right now to wickedlysmartwomen.com to join our community, share your takeaways, ask questions, or submit guest suggestions. Thank you for tuning in. Keep your ears open. And remember, you are a wonderful woman. Thanks for tuning in, downloading, and listening. Be sure to rate and review Wickedly Smart Women on Apple Podcasts and share with other women who can benefit from today's episode. Wickedly Smart Women is the premier podcast series for informing, activating, and inspiring the leader who carries profound wisdom and knows that now is the time to welcome wealth. We welcome your feedback and guest suggestions and invite you to subscribe to our mailing list to be notified of each new episode at wickedlysmartwomen.com.